All right, so welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, this is, uh, I believe we're at part eight of our uh, of CAFC's webinar series on the FASD screening toolkit. Uh, this one's titled Validating Guiding Principles and Recommendations for the Role of uh, Maconi MFA EE Screen. Uh, as always with all of our webinars, we will be uh, recording these webinars and posting them on the CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. We do have our full, uh, all of our FASD information is on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, including the, the, the toolkit itself, which has all of our the various tools, including including the information about the meconium tool that we're discussing today, uh, the the previous presentation on the meconium tool, which included the, the presentation as well from Dr. Sarkar on the maternal history uh, drinking uh, maternal history guide. Um, we also have some of the information that a lot of this uh, this today's talk is based on, which was uh, some of the foundation for this work was laid back in a session in PEI that was recorded. Uh, where we had a combined live and webinar audience. Uh, we have some, some of the recommendations that, as they were presented to uh, the audience at the FACE conference in uh, Prince Edward Island, as well as some of the information that was presented by Dr. Bosby on their program in, in using a, a Nermaconium study. And then, of course, today's uh, presentation will be recorded and put uh, on, the, on the Knowledge Exchange Network here when it's available. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over the uh, virtual podium to uh, CAFC's President and CEO, Elaine Orbein. Thank you, Doug, and, and uh, welcome to everyone from across the country, and uh, good morning uh, for our Western colleagues, and good afternoon for those in the East. It's really my pleasure to welcome everyone to CAFC's FASD webinar series, and um, our series really began in March of 2011, and has been, um, as, has welcomed participants well into the thousands at this point, um, many from the majority from across Canada, and many, many colleagues uh, worldwide have, have joined the CAFC FASD webinars. And, uh, and we're just delighted to continue that series and, and perhaps become a little bit more focused today on um, validating guiding principles and recommendations for the role of meconium FAEE screening. Um, we're going to leave the agenda up before you just just during my uh, brief introduction. And um, what I wanted to do was just provide everyone with just a little bit of, of background. Um, in CAFC's work um, with our uh, steering committee, led by our national steering committee, um, and uh, strong support coming from our Public Health Agency of Canada, and Health Canada colleagues, just to give you a little bit of background on how and where this all began. This being the development of a national screening toolkit for children and youth identified and potentially affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. On March 1st, so just a little bit of history that probably many are aware of, of course, on March 1 of 2005, um, the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Canadian Guidelines for Diagnosis were published uh, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. The development of those guidelines was facilitated by the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada and led once again by the expertise of um, many of, of CAFC's National FASD Steering Committee and I will also venture a guess to say that some of you have joined us on online this afternoon, uh, likely were involved in the development of those diagnosis guidelines. However, when the guidelines were published in 05, there were in fact no valid and reliable screening tools um, for consistent screening of children for a possible FASD. And this certainly was limiting, um, specific to the ability of healthcare and allied professionals, as well as families working with children with behavioral and learning disabilities, to consistently screen for FASD and then refer for further assessment and diagnosis. To address this specific need and screening gap, if you will, CAFC and our National Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder uh, Steering Committee 
um, began working collaboratively with the Public Health Agency of Canada, First Nations, Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada, and I want to add, and it's so important for me to mention, at this point, many um, collaborators, researchers, and content experts from across Canada to address this very issue. And our work began in uh, 2007. I want to acknowledge and express CAFC's appreciation to our steering committee, our national steering committee, who are really leading this work. And that is to uh, Dr. Gideon Corrin, um, Dr. Ted Rosales, Dr. Albert Chudley, Dr. Stuart McLeod, and Stuart is with us this afternoon, is going to be moderating the session, Dr. Christine Locke, Dr. Sterling Claren. I want to recognize our senior project manager, Charlotte Rosenbaum, who has been with me and with CAFC throughout this process. And um, once again, all of the researchers and collaborators and many workshop participants who have truly lended their um, expertise and um, contribution for the last several years. I would be remiss as well if I didn't acknowledge the tremendous support and encouragement that has come from our colleagues at the Public Health Agency as well as First Nations Inuit Health Branch in Health Canada. So just very briefly, and, um, and I, I was just so delighted that Doug took us on a very quick virtual tour of CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network because it's really important for us to share with everyone online today that the complete screening toolkit is available on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, and we were Knowledge Exchange Network as KEN, K-E-N. Access to that is, um, is, is very simple from, from CAFC's website. Our screening toolkit in fact, um, has targeted at this point in time five areas, meconium testing, neurobehavioral screening, the medicine wheel, student index, as well as developmental history tools, the Asante Center probation officer tool, as well as the maternal drinking guide. And, and of course, there's a very broad population and sectors that are targeted within those five tools as well. We have, um, we've, I've mentioned briefly, and, and Doug started us off by identifying that um, this, in fact, I believe this is the seventh webinar in our, in our national series that began back in March of 2011. And um, all webinars are available for you. Um, in, in terms of our podcasts and presentations um, on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And, uh, and, and we are building that library uh, to continue um, our, um, our commitment to, uh, to knowledge translation and to sharing this information with, uh, with a very broad community. Um, where, where we are now in terms of our, our work and, and, uh, and, and continuing um, the development of this tool, I think it's important at this point for me to point out that our screening toolkit, we refer to it as a living document. And that with the purpose and goal and objective of each one of our webinars is to continue to develop this screening toolkit to bring new information to its development, to identify new screening tools that are not part of the kit right now. There is a, I won't go into that in detail today, but we have a certain established uh, set of criteria in terms of um, exploring new opportunities around tool development that we will follow. And uh, your input on today's webinar and in future um, events like this is really key to the ongoing development of the screening toolkit. Um, what I, without really any any further um, ado, it, it's um, it's absolutely my pleasure to welcome 
uh, Dr. Stuart McLeod as our moderator uh, for today's webinar. I also want to thank Stuart on behalf of CAFC for your tremendous leadership, Stuart, over many years now in helping us to bring our National Screening Toolkit to so many people. Today's um, webinar on our FAEE testing, as well as we'll, we'll come back to this um, at the end of the call today, we have another webinar tomorrow that is going to be welcoming some colleagues who have been using our probation officer tool, our neurobehavioral screening tool, as well as our um, maternal drinking guide who have actually been using these tools and tomorrow's webinar will focus on some feedback on the tools utility and impact and how these um, how these tools in fact are being used. We'll, we'll leave everyone with, with just a bit of information on tomorrow's uh, webinar um, before we close. Stuart, um, once again, thank you for your leadership today and um, it is my pleasure to turn uh, the virtual podium over to you. Uh, well, Elaine, thanks uh, very much. And, uh, you know, first of all, I, I should say that we're all very appreciative of, of all the, uh, the work that CAFC has been doing uh, on FASD over the last several years. And, and uh, I think the working partnership that you've developed uh, with uh, the public health agency and with the First Nations Inuit Health Branch is, is really uh, exemplary. So it's it's terrific that we're moving, as you've described, from uh, uh, looking at diagnostic guidelines and trying to get some standardization there uh, to to an active discussion of, of screening potential screening tests. And now with the toolkit, I think we're in a position where we can we can validate the use of some of the tools that have been described and and begin to move toward um, use of the information that we get from the toolkits uh, from the, from the tools uh, to to begin to formulate policies that will really uh, help with prevention of FASD and and, and help with uh, treatment of, of those uh, uh, children and adults who who are uh, afflicted. So what I'm going to say uh, today is is really building very much on the uh, meetings that we had last September in Prince Edward Island. Uh, we're going along with my uh, speakers on the panel. Uh, we're going to try to uh, to get a sense of where uh, where we are with the application of meconium uh, testing for fatty acid ethyl esters. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a tool that we've known about now for a number of years, but there's still a fair amount of controversy about how best uh, to use it. Uh, uh, being whimsical for a moment, I hope you can all see my elephant and the blind men. Um, uh, but it's it's clear as we talk about meconium testing for FAEE -E -E, -E -E -E, that there's a uh, there's a variety of uh, opinions. I mean, some people uh, uh, perhaps mistakenly think of this as a, a tool that's going to be used in dealing with individual patients in their practice. Uh, we don't uh, generally see it that way at all. This is, uh, if, if it was going to be all about uh, speaking with an individual uh, patient, it, you might just uh, drill down and, and get a detailed drinking history and, uh, and rely on that, although from practice, we, we know that it's uh, it's difficult in many cases uh, to get a reliable drinking history. The, the the real use of meconium testing is to do population studies to get some idea of the likely extent of um, uh, of uh, ethanol consumption during pregnancy in in a given population, and then tailor. Uh, policies, both clinical policies and public policies, uh, to fit with uh, uh, with what you've learned from from the uh, from the screening test. Uh, last September in uh, Charlottetown, actually it wasn't really in Charlottetown; it was in Stanhope, uh, a little bit north of uh, Charlottetown. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, discussion that included about forty. Uh, 
um, stakeholders and content experts who were actually in the room with us, and, and a similar number of people who were hooked in by webinar, uh, mostly from across Canada. Uh, and uh, the idea in the discussion at that time was to see if we could reach a consensus on uh, on how uh, best to deploy meconium testing more widely than has been the case uh, uh, until now. And, and we came out of the, uh, the session on September 12th with some recommendations, which I'm going to present to you uh, again. And these, these were actually presented to a larger uh, group at the, uh, the, the FACE meeting, uh, the Fetal Alcohol Canadian Experts meeting that took place again in PEI at uh, Stanhope uh, the day following the, uh, the original symposium. Um, and actually the results of that uh, discussion, both the closed discussion and the, uh, and the <clears throat> presentation to FACE uh, have now been published uh, in editorial form uh, um, in the Journal of Population Thera Therapeutics and Clinical Pharmacology. So any of you who want to uh, read the uh, deathless prose provided by myself and Edie Corrin can, uh, can find it there. Uh, but I'm going to say most of what's in the article here. Uh, the background, and uh, probably most of you uh, on, on the uh, webinar today are well familiar with this, but uh, FASD is actually the most common form of prevent preventable cerebral injury seen in Canada today, and therefore it, it has medical importance, it has social importance, and it definitely has economic uh, importance. Uh, but the, the really the key thing is that this is a preventable cerebral injury. Um, and I think all of us who've been working in this field understand that that uh, having some indication of the scope of prenatal ethanol exposure uh, is uh, is really a key uh, to identifying children at risk for FAS or FASD uh, and uh, knowing something of the scope of the problem in a particular population may may serve to uh, enhance uh, clinical vigilance in in looking for cases of, of FAS or FASD. Um, meconium testing, as it's been described, actually complies very well with guidelines that were set out by WHO about a decade ago um, when, when they started to look at um, FASD as a uh, global health uh, issue. Uh, uh, they've underscored the need um, for screen ethanol uh, screening procedures that will give us some idea of ethanol use in a population, and particularly in, in, uh, in the situation of pregnancy. Uh, and there is really no other screening test uh, of this kind that we're aware of uh, that is uh, respectful of individual privacy and, and, and can be used on a population basis without attaching any uh, stigma to, to individual patients. Um, the discussion in PEI really came around uh, to a, a strong emphasis on universal screening um, uh, as opposed to really targeted screening. I mean, the ultimate example of targeted screening would be to look at individual patients, but as I've said, that really wouldn't be much in advance on, on good uh, medical history. But by using universal screening within a population, we can avoid stigmatization of any segment of the population, uh, and we can get indicators of incidence, prevalence, dose effect, and, uh, and uh, validation of the meconium test by establishing what link there is between the levels of FAE measured in meconium and the uh, eventual uh, incidence of FAS and FASD in that population. Um, I guess to be optimistic about it, uh, and I think this really was the consensus from the meeting in PEI, uh, universal screening, or wider, wider adoption of universal screening would begin to give us the kind of evidence that we need in, in order to garner 
support from the political sector and uh, and resources to expand screening, assessment, and eventually treatment uh, of children with FAS and FASD. Um, there's a strong feeling, I think, among all of us who've been looking at this that uh, we shouldn't just be stampeded into recommending universal screening. It's only really appropriate uh, in situations where there, we can offer some assurance that there are appropriate follow-up services uh, for for uh, infants, uh, for the mothers, uh, and for their families. Um, so it is important to think about exactly the context in which uh, meconium testing can be used. Uh, we all agreed in the, at the PEI meeting that the test has been validated, uh, and it's an objective test of fetal exposure to uh, ethanol. Uh, it's important to note that, that it only really uh, uh, provides a window uh, on ethanol consumption during the second and third trimester. Uh, it uh, tells you nothing uh, about the first trimester and, uh, and of course, uh, all of us who've been interested in the uh, influence of drugs or chemicals on fetal uh, uh, development realize that the critical period uh, for such effects is usually uh, in around 12 weeks of gestation. So we're missing that key point. Um, however, it's pretty clear uh, that if uh, an individual is consuming ethanol during the second and third trimester, there's a pretty good chance uh, that uh, she was also consuming ethanol in the first trimester. However, you know that that said, uh, when we uh, even if we were looking at an individual positive result on meconium testing, we have to recognize that that, that uh, a positive test does not in any way translate directly to a diagnosis of FAS or FASD in in the infant that's been exposed. Uh, we we were told uh, from several sources in uh, Charlottetown. Uh, that the, uh, at the very best, the predictive value of meconium testing, if it was applied on an individual basis, would be of the order of 40%. Uh, so uh, of 100, uh, 100 positive meconium tests, uh, there, might be, uh, there might be 40 children uh, resulting uh, who had at least some of the stigma uh, of FASD or FAS. <coughs> Um, uh, once, uh, even again, looking on an individual basis, if a positive meconium uh, FAEE test was obtained, uh, there would still be a necessity for long-term follow-up and careful monitoring uh, in order to determine whether uh, the clinical uh, picture would support a diagnosis uh, of uh, FAS or FASD. Uh, and then, of course, there would be a requirement for very detailed uh, study to understand the developmental effects uh, in, in a particular infant. Um, so we, and this, the last point on this slide really speaks to uh, the issue that uh, some people are concerned with, and that is uh, the ethics of using meconium testing and the potential uh, legal uh, intrusion uh, that, that might be associated with positive meconium tests. Uh, we can't say this too strongly. Uh, meconium testing results alone are not a direct indicator of child endangerment or any, uh, nor should they ever be interpreted as indicative of compromised parenting capacity. So this is not, we. We absolutely want to avoid any sense that this is a punitive, punitive test. Um, we did have uh, uh, lawyers with us in uh, in PEI, and uh, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, advocacy and maternal rights and and how the meconium uh, testing relates to uh, decision making or policy making. Um, we and and there was a very very strong uh, consensus, overwhelmingly strong consensus that any comprehensive meconium uh, 
testing and screening program should also include uh, an advocacy program that protects uh, maternal rights and, and uh, guarantees as far as is possible uh, absolute respect for the maternal child family unit. Uh, and that point is really repeated in the, the next bullet that testing should be embedded within a system of family-centered care. Uh, it must consider uh, the needs of both mother and child. Uh, it's While we're all committed to child protection uh, in this, it cannot be done at the expense of uh, maternal rights. Um, when, um, when there are uh, uh, issues um, identified concerning maternal ethanol consumption, um, the majority of people in PEI uh, definitely felt that uh, that should be a starting point for a process of negotiation, education, mediation, uh, and, and not in any, uh, in any situation uh, uh, an immediate uh, entry point into, uh, into legal action. Um, I mean, this is not business that the lawyers uh, uh, want, and we need to deal with this as a social issue rather than a, a legal issue. Uh, we, did, uh, we did have a recommendation from the meeting um, in uh, PEI uh, that um, thought should be given to bringing together medical and legal representatives in, in a forum to discuss ethical and legal considerations surrounding the use of meconium uh, fetal uh, fatty acid uh, ester testing uh, in order to make sure that we are protecting infants while assuring the rights of mothers. Um, there were a couple of lawyers with us in PEI who were very enthusiastic about doing this. Uh, Bernard uh, Dickens, who's a, a professor of law at the University of uh, Toronto, and Anna uh, Zajunaski from uh, which, uh, from Calgary, uh, both of whom uh, feel that uh, lawyers need to work closely with ethicists in order to sort out exactly how best to use meconium uh, testing. Uh, just uh, in closing, a couple of uh, points uh, for further thought. Uh, I've mentioned already that, that uh, there's a hope that better screening and better use of population screening, such as meconium testing, uh, may uh, help us to alleviate uh, the enormous costs of FAS and FASD. Uh, here's a, a paper published in 2009 uh, that uh, produced an estimate uh, uh, of the cost of FAS and FASD in Canada as being greater than $5 billion annually. So that's an extreme uh, cost uh, for a condition which is potentially uh, preventable. Uh, there's also uh, been uh, work done by Dr. Corrin and his colleagues uh, on the cost-benefit analysis of meconium uh, testing, and there's a, a reference to their uh, publication again in 2009 looking at uh, the cost-effectiveness of universal and targeted screening uh, for <coughs> ethanol exposure uh, in, in utero. And just a few final thoughts then about uh, costs and benefits. I, I've all just shown you the, the cost-benefit uh, studies that have, have been done. I think it's fair to say that there's room for more extensive uh, testing of this kind, uh, analysis of this kind. Uh, and it's quite likely that the uh, conclusions may differ from population to population. But, but uh, certainly before anybody advocates for wider use uh, of uh, meconium testing, uh, we have to be sure that there is going to be uh, a benefit uh, in proportion to the cost. Um, uh, we, we do believe that uh, wider use of universal uh, screening would uh, provide us with a, uh, a better platform for talking with provinces uh, about uh, uh, about uh, uh, 
uh, how they should use meconium uh, testing and uh, and uh, how they should structure their entire program of uh, FASD uh, prevention or, or treatment. Um, we uh, one, one of the arguments against why more widespread use of meconium testing right now uh, is uh, that the cost per test is really quite high. Uh, usually require includes uh, transportation of samples to a central laboratory, uh, but it's uh, very clear, I think, to all of us uh, that if more widespread or universal testing programs were undertaken in, in a jurisdiction, uh, that the cost of an individual test would come down uh, quite uh, rapidly and this would in turn uh, alter the cost benefit uh, analysis. Uh, there was an opinion expressed in PEI that uh, this would be a very good topic for CADA the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health uh, to take on and uh, uh, that uh, perhaps they could work with provincial uh, health uh, technology uh, assessment agencies uh, to work toward a Canadian, uh, a Canada-wide uh, analysis uh, to, to help us uh, settle on the place of meconium uh, FAEE testing uh, across the country. Uh, so, uh, a little, another one final whimsical slide, uh, the dogs baying at the moon and wondering whether they're making an impact. Uh, I think uh, those of us who've been working on FASD screening and particularly on uh, the population screening with uh, meconium testing, I believe that we are uh, making an impact and we could make a, a much uh, greater uh, impact if this were more widely deployed. Uh, in, uh, in a universal screening program. So uh, that's uh, the end of uh, my comments. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up, but if, if any of you need some clarification, please uh, uh, please uh, send us a message. Um, failing that, I'm going to um, uh, turn the uh, turn the microphone now over to uh, Joey Guerreri. Uh, Joey, uh, I think I have to click something here. Uh, Joey uh, is uh, the manager of the Mother Risk uh, Laboratory in the Division of Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, he's been working in this uh, area for some time uh, with uh, Dr. Corrin uh, and undoubtedly uh, uh, knows uh, more about it uh, than the rest of us. Uh, Joey is uh, presently uh, uh, pursuing uh, his PhD in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at U of T uh, in this uh, area and uh, he's now going to uh, uh, tell us uh, some of his experience, uh, uh, particularly in uh, Grey Bruce County in Ontario. So Joey, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. McLeod. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to uh, my West Coast colleagues. Um, I'm going to discuss some of the experience we've had in employing the uh, fatty acid ethyl ester meconium test. Um, just one moment while I get my presentation going. Uh, so one question often is, you know, what are FAE? So just to just to give you a quick demonstration, when ethanol is uh, is taken into the body, it will be processed by a number of different pathways. Now the majority of ethanol gets burned off to carbon dioxide and water and uh, remains undetectable in, in any sort of uh, laboratory test. Um, what's commonly uh, or historically has been seen is ethanol that's present in urine uh, or uh, present in breath, so for breathalyzer ethanol. But that's very transient. So what fatty acid ethyl esters are, are ethanol combined with free fatty acids which circulate for a longer period of time in the body and are incorporated into meconium. So the basic model is when alcohol is consumed by a pregnant woman, the alcohol crosses the placenta, enters the fetal circulation, and in the fetal circulation combines with fatty acids and forms FAEEs which are detectable in the newborn's meconium. 
Meconium is a baby's first few bowel movements. It's the black tarry uh, stool that, that they pass very near uh, after delivery. It starts to form at about 12 weeks of pregnancy uh, when the initiation of fetal swallowing begins. So as, uh, as Stuart said, the first trimester history is excluded from meconium. We're only seeing late pregnancy uh, use of alcohol. Uh, and the FAE meconium test is able to detect higher levels of alcohol consumption. Women who consume very low levels of alcohol, such as uh, a couple of drinks per month spaced out, uh, are indistinguishable from non-drinking women based on this test. So all the studies seem to indicate that this test is more capable of detecting individuals who binge drink uh, or drink at, at uh, relatively high daily levels of alcohol during late pregnancy. Some advantages over blood and urine are the longer detection window, um, which is a major advantage, and also that it's a discarded material, so the collection is relatively easy and non-invasive. Um, doing urine analysis, for example, on a newborn can be quite challenging in terms of collecting a sufficient amount of urine and uh, it, removing that urine from the diaper from a cotton swab. So the reason we uh, look at testing meconium is because of the transient nature of alcohol in conventional matrices. One standard drink contains about uh, 14 grams of al alcohol or ethanol. And our bodies eliminate alcohol at about 7 grams per hour. So someone who has a binge episode of alcohol consumption, let's say about 5 drinks in an hour, their urine can be negative for alcohol within 12 hours. So this is a very, very small window of detection. As uh, Stuart previously mentioned, we know that there are issues with the sensitivity of maternal self-report due to the stigma of um, disclosing problematic alcohol use in pregnancy, but there are also limitations with conventional laboratory methods. So routinely available urine testing for ethanol really, if it's negative, is providing no valuable information. This graph just shows a visual representation of what's available through urine analysis versus meconium in terms of detection window. So you can see that the meconium represents a, approximately a three to six month time frame preceding birth, which far exceeds uh, what's available by any other conventional matrix for analysis. And this, this actually holds true for drugs of abuse as well. Clinically, the test is used uh, quite a bit in uh, many hospitals across Canada who refer samples to the hospital for sick children here in Toronto. Um, our laboratory tests for both FAE for alcohol as well as for drugs of abuse, and the testing is currently targeted. It's meconium analysis is secondary to routinely available laboratory methods and maternal history. So the majority of cases we deal with are already clinically are already involved in social services, where uh, high risk pregnancy has been identified, and they require. Uh, the ability to obtain evidence of prenatal exposure to plan for the child. Um, sample, this is different, I want to make a note of assuming that a positive result indicates that there is a, a safety or an endangerment risk to a child. What we have in current practice is a pre-selected population. So these are individuals that for factors other than alcohol or drug use, or in addition to alcohol or drug use, uh, a safety issue has been raised and planning is currently underway, where uh, due to the lack of sensitivity of maternal self-report in urine, uh, meconium analysis offers a much more reliable measure of prenatal exposure. And samples tested for FAE should be collected within 24 hours of birth. Um, the risk of false positive results increases after 24 hours due to bacterial colonization of the infant gut. And children that do test positive are recommended to undergo FASD assessment after the age of three years. Um, three is the low. Usually it's at least four years old that you'd want to uh, 
bring a child in for FASD assessment. And we can't emphasize this point too strongly. It's a screening test. Screening means you're not identifying people who have a disease. It's not a diagnosis of FASD. You're identifying people at risk for FASD. So follow-up is required, and we do not want any child labeled that's alcohol exposed as already having a developmental disability. So I'm going to discuss how we've applied these, uh, this test in a research context where it has proven extremely valuable. Most of our studies have been conducted in the Grey Bruce region of Ontario. Um, Grey Bruce is, uh, is in southwestern Ontario. Um, there's a little blow up of it. There we go. Uh, and it contains Owen Sound as the primary uh, as the primary city, uh, as long as with with a, a bunch of other sites. There's about five birthing hospitals at the time that our studies began uh, back in uh, 2004. We had a series of studies here. The first looked at general population anonymous screening for meconium FAEE, and in this study, informed consent was not required, as no identifying information was uh, accompanied. Uh, the meconium samples. Uh, all studies, of course, go through uh, research ethics boards and are conducted uh, in accordance with uh, required uh, ethical obligations. So our results for this first study, after analysis of uh, 682 samples from this region, showed a fetal alcohol exposure rate in this population of 2.5%. When we look at what was commonly done uh, in this group, uh, the only available information to the public health unit was a personal interview by the nurse conducted in conjunction with the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program in Ontario. And on this questionnaire, there is one yes or no question asking if there was diagnosed drug or alcohol abuse in pregnancy. So in the absence of this meconium study, the public health unit would have had uh, an indication that there was a 0.5% prevalence of drug or alcohol use in pregnancy in that entire population, which is five-fold lower than what we determined for alcohol use alone. This doesn't even include drugs of abuse. Several studies have estimated that uh, FASD affects approximately 1% of, of the North American population. And as Stuart said, the uh, 40% is assumed to be the um, predictive value for FASD from an alcohol, a heavily alcohol exposed pregnancy. So what we learned from this first study was that the meconium FAE test performed very well, not only in identifying uh, more children uh, exposed to problematic drinking late in pregnancy than currently used methods by the public health unit, but that when we look at the number of exposed against the likelihood of FASD that the estimate uh, was very consistent with other studies that have been done estimating approximately a 1% general population FASD risk. Uh, we followed up this study looking at children born to high-risk pregnancies from this region. This population was not captured in the first study. Uh, because this is a relatively rural region, Women with high-risk pregnancies were diverted down to London, Ontario to a tertiary care hospital for labor and delivery. This um, study was published in 2010. And what we found by looking at the uh, neonatal intensive care unit was that we had a significantly higher positivity rate of uh, FA FAEE. So we found that in the high-risk pregnancies, there were uh, 10 times more children who were exposed to heavy amounts of alcohol prenatally. The participation rates, because this was also an anonymous study, were uh, the same. Now, following that study, we took the next step and uh, assessed an opt-in model screening program in this population. We selected this population because there was very, relatively low numbers, uh, and we had the cooperation of the public health unit to provide early life follow-up services 
Follow-up services, of course, being required for any medical screen. Um, it is, it cannot ethically, you cannot ethically screen a child for something if you cannot offer them a therapeutic benefit from whatever it is you're screening for. So there has to be a benefit to that child being identified as at risk. So this study looked at a non-anonymous uh, universal screening in that neonatal intensive care population in that high-risk pregnancy population with the early life follow-up services done by a public health unit and down the road at age three um, FASD assessment will be done at the hospital for sick children. Uh, here is uh, just the layout of how this study was conducted. A um, woman enters the birthing site. She was provided uh, informed consent requested to participate in this voluntary screening program. Uh, if she refused, then she went along her way and, and, uh, and delivered her child. Um, if she consented, then we collected the meconium and, and uh, analyzed for FAE. If it was positive, that child was enrolled through the public health unit in a six-year follow-up program through the Healthy Babies and Healthy Children program. So what we were doing is taking children at risk because of prenatal alcohol exposure, for they're at risk for neurodevelopmental deficits, and we're shunting them into existing uh, support programs for healthy child development. And uh, if any delays were detected, then intervention programs and diagnostic services uh, were offered to the mother and the child. What we found when we moved from anonymous to non-anonymous screening is that the participation rate dropped significantly and the FAE positivity rate dropped significantly. Now, this said, that does not mean that this, this uh, study did not show us some benefits. Uh, we actually had one very promising case report. They were relatively small numbers. I uh, believe it was about 40 kids enrolled uh, or 40 mothers enrolled. But uh, we had one child that was positive uh, that at three months looked perfectly fine, but at six months started to show delays. Um, and at 14 months was, uh, was referred by a clinical psychologist into speech and language services. So this child was, benefited directly from early identification and the uh, additional monitoring by the public health nurse. Anecdotally, uh, with this model, having a public health nurse assigned to the family uh, was beneficial for the mothers who enrolled as well. They found the additional support uh, to be very useful to them. So some final thoughts as I wrap up my presentation. Um, meconium FAE analysis offers improved sensitivity over maternal self-report. This is extremely important um, when we're trying to get an accurate history. Um, Self-report is an important first line, but because of the limitations, we have to know what's available beyond that uh, if we require to investigate further. Uh, and this is uh, both in, in a research and a clinical context. Um, and meconium offers a longer detection window than any other available laboratory method. Now, with the universal anonymous FAE meconium screening, uh, it's shown itself to be a valuable tool in determining prenatal alcohol exposure incidence. Non-anonymous universal screening is uh, likely to be ineffective in establishing an accurate incidence of prenatal alcohol exposure in a population, but it has shown promise in identifying affected children at a very early age. Targeted screening is already done, but as, as Stuart uh, mentioned in his opening presentation, this can't be done in absence of support services, and it is not a first line. It's a secondary line once other methods of determining prenatal alcohol exposure risk have been exhausted. So I'd like to just thank uh, Dr. Corin, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Goh, and, and Irene Zellner for their contributions to, uh, to my data here. And uh, I'll wrap up my presentation and uh, hand it off to uh, Kathy. Uh, well, let me just intervene for a minute, Joey. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, uh, for that uh, excellent review of the, uh, the work you've been doing over the last 
few years. Um, we, we are going to move on now to uh, to Kathy Bigsby uh, to hear about uh, a parallel uh, experiment that's underway in uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, Kathy is a uh, consulting pediatrician at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in uh, Charlottetown and has been there since 1995. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was a product of Saskatchewan, a family doctor and uh, initially and then training in uh, pediatrics and uh, from her Saskatchewan day she has a long-standing interest uh, in uh, FASD. Uh, the work uh, that she's about to tell us about uh, was undertaken as part of a perinatal research program in, in Prince Edward Island. So Kathy, over to you. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay there, so I was a little confused. Sorry about that. I'm just going to very briefly talk about our, um, our PEI meconium project. The, um, uh, our purpose was, was a little different from what uh, led Joy to embark on his study. We really set out to try to get an idea of what the incidence of heavy alcohol exposure was during pregnancy in PEI because we were very concerned about um, the lack of understanding in our province about uh, how much FASD we had. And so our project was about um, uh, uh, doing meconium testing and then comparing the data from the meconium testing with our own perinatal database which included self-reports of alcohol use and what we really hope to do with this is to use the information to advance public policy on primary secondary and tertiary prevention of FASD in our province and then an, another goal is of course to add to the data on the incidence of high levels of FAEE and meconium and to understand some of the, lo the logistical issues in sample collection so our process was, uh, as it was in Gray Bruce, was an anonymous sample collection. Uh, what we did was we, we set out to include all Prince Edward Island infants. Uh, so those were born, those born in PEI, and we just have two centers, uh, but also those high-risk babies who were born in Nova Scotia. We had also planned to include the babies in New Brunswick, but we were unable to get ethics approval for this anonymous study uh, to cover those babies born in Moncton, but those numbers were very small. We set out to collect samples um, and uh, we put them in uh, little vials. We froze them, bought some freezers, froze them and shif shipped them to the Mother Risk Lab in Toronto. We have just uh, started to uh, get our data together. The sample collection was undertaken from October of, of uh, 2010 to October 2011, and we've just had um, our first round of, of sample results back. I guess actually that was back in, in October, just before that September, or rather August, just before that September meeting here. Um, what we've had back is that we, we had no refusal. So while this was an anonymous study, we did not require consent, we let families know that we were doing it. And the option was there for, for people to uh, say that they did not want to participate. And we know that we had some missed samples. And one example that came to mind was an infant who didn't pass meconium and had a congenital microcolon. So of the first quarter samples, there were 326 samples submitted. Just 10 of the samples were actually stool, meaning that the baby had already passed all the meconium and what came out next was not uh, meconium, or just a sample that was too small to process. Three of the samples uh, had inconclusive results, and six of our samples were positive for, for FAE, or 1.8%, which is um, you know, in the same ballpark as the Gray Bruce study, as I say, our sample numbers are small and we're, we're expecting a total of about 1,200 samples. The, um, the project was undertaken by our uh, perinatal uh, research group under the direction of jo Dr. Janet Bryanton. And, um, and as I say, when we get the rest of our results together, we're, we're really excited about, um, you know, pulling the information together and comparing it with our database uh, to see if we get the similar results to what was found in Gray Bruce. And I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kathy. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, look forward to seeing the, the full results of your study, but that uh, looks like your results uh, so far are in line with the, uh, the Gray Bruce experience. Uh, allowing for the, uh, the slightly more conservative nature of uh, PEI citizens. Uh, the um, 
I think at this point we're that completes our formal presentation. So now we're open uh, to input from our online uh, participants, um, either by entering questions, um, typed messages, or I think uh, Doug has the capacity to uh, to let you speak if you wish to speak. Yeah, so exactly as, uh, as Dr. McLeod said, uh, either type in a question into the question box or click the raise hand button and we will attempt to unmute you and let you speak uh, to the presenters and ask your question. Uh, may mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead Elaine. No, no, go ahead. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the issues that was, um, that really provoked a, uh, an excellent discussion when we were together in PEI last September was looking down the road and, and the, the possibility, the reality of universal screening. And Stuart, Joey, and, and Kathy, I'm, I'm wondering if, if I can turn that, that question or that opportunity, that vision for the future over to each one of you just to make a comment on, on what you think may happen, should happen, um, and perhaps maybe some barriers and, and, uh, and enablers? Um, that's, uh, that's an excellent question, Elaine. Uh, uh, maybe I can uh, turn first to Joey? Yes. Okay, have, you, have you a response to oh, Elaine? Uh, uh, do I get to go first? Yes. Okay, okay uh, thanks, Elaine. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think it can't be emphasized em enough that uh, the follow the follow up testing is the is the biggest barrier um, from a resource standpoint. Um, we have to ensure that harm is not done when we're looking for children that we want to help. Um, so the test right now is used clinically in, in, a, in relatively controlled conditions. So there are individuals uh, dealing with uh, addiction issues, sorry, you know, individual patients that have workers that are used to dealing with addiction issues. They are, uh, they're, you know, abreast of what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and it's a very closed loop situation, particularly with social services. So you have kids being identified and then they're sort of co-opted into the social services uh, mandate for taking care of these kids and supporting the families until they can close the file. But in our medical system, we don't have the long-term follow-up infrastructure right now to identify a child at birth and then follow them and ensure they're diagnosed at three or four years of age. So really, I think the first steps of establishing accurate prevalence, as we're discussing right now, right. is very key in getting um, reliable and numbers that are acceptable to the uh, to the medical community as our our disease risk, so that we can allot the appropriate resources to follow up um, with positive cases. There's a, the massive stigma about addiction and pregnancy and, and alcohol use in pregnancy is going to be a big barrier. Um, that's something that's dealt with not just in the context of, of FASD, but across the board with addictions. Um, we still, a lot in a lot of areas, have a moralistic approach to people with addictions, and um, that's been changing over time. But right now, that's a massive barrier. And, women, um, until they see otherwise, are going to assume that more harm can be done by this type of information being known than good. Uh, thanks, Joey. Uh, Kathy, uh, a comment from, uh, from the PEI perspective. Uh, perhaps you could tell us, uh, in, as part of your answer, what happened in New Brunswick and why, why uh, your colleagues in New Brunswick were not, uh, not willing to participate in your study. Well, I have a biased opinion here, of course, but um, what happened in, in New Brunswick was that the folks there were just not convinced that this, as a study, met criteria for a study that, was ethic, that, that should be done in an ethical manner without consent. And specifically, um, they thought that it was possible to do the same work 
uh, with consent, even though we presented to them the information from Joey's study that showed clearly once you started asking for consent, you, you um, lost more positives than you lost negatives, and it um, had a profound Im impact on your overall results. So we knew that our research question would not, would not be answered if we, uh, if we sought consent. And I think it's a, um, uh, we worked fairly hard at trying to, to make our point. And truth be told, our study was about half done by the time uh, we were kind of getting that second feedback, but they were still rejecting our uh, proposal. And we, we really decided to give up at that point. There, were, there are very few PEI babies born in New Brunswick. But I think uh, part of the point is those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about this um, can get a pretty clear picture in our own minds of uh, what the ethical issues are. Uh, we think we understand what we're testing and why we're doing it. But it's a totally different um, game when you're when you're trying to share that with the public. And I thought about this actually a lot recently because I'm also on our regional newborn screening program committee. And, you know, we think our standard newborn screening stuff is pretty straightforward, you know, the PKUs and TSHs and things like that. And the staff at the, the program in Halifax were talking about um, the grief that they get trying to, to phone families to discuss uh, results. And, uh, and again, you know, we think it's pretty straightforward. This is pretty hard stuff for the average person to uh, to really understand. And I can see some huge challenges um, trying to interpret results uh, for families and also for other professionals, both medical and non-medical. Right. Um, so I, I guess um, you know it is uh, it is easy to understand why there would be quite a bit of pushback on. Uh, when uh, one talks about individualized testing, but it's much much harder to uh, understand why there would be objection to universal anonymized uh, screening. And uh, unfortunately, even after at least 50 years of talking about uh, FASD, we're still in a situation where there are many jurisdictions that are, are really in denial. Uh, I mean, there are countries that uh, don't want to acknowledge that FASD is a, a problem, notwithstanding the fact that uh, there are individual researchers for reporting uh, cases. Um, but uh, unless we can get acceptance of some kind of non-punitive uh, screening, um, certainly anonymized at least until such time as we have an idea of the uh, incidence uh, or, or the, the number of children at risk in a population. It, it's hard to imagine how we can make progress on the policy uh, front. So I, I actually think it would be uh, very useful if the work, if the good work that's been done in Canada on, uh, uh, on meconium testing uh, could be exported perhaps to some countries where we think the risk is probably quite high. Mm -hmm. I mean, one that comes to mind would be the United Kingdom, where uh, there's relatively little written about uh, uh, about uh, FAS or FASD, and yet uh, I think the, uh, uh, the, the drinking habits of, uh, of the British are uh, uh, at, least the, at least equal to those of Canadians. Um, and we do know that there are other countries that that are, have been more open to considering FAS and FASD, where, um, uh, where and some countries where you might not think that ethanol consumption would be very uh, high, but I, I'm thinking of a place like South Africa, uh, where uh, it turns out that there is a substantial consumption of homemade beer. Uh, in rural communities, and, and in fact, the South Africans have been very open about acknowledging the the uh, extent to which FASD is a is a problem, or is becoming a, uh, a problem. So it's hard to imagine how I, I showed you the uh, cost effectiveness, um, uh, or the estimated uh, cost of FASD and FAS in Canada, five billion dollars a year. Uh, I mean, it's hard to think of any other public health problem of that magnitude um, uh, that we know so little uh, so little about and uh, here we have a tool which would at least allow us to 
firm up some of those uh, estimates of cost, and uh, uh, and yet uh, at least some some of our colleagues uh, are actually opposed to, uh, to to learning the truth. So I'm a little surprised, but I do have great hope that a uh, that the use of uh, of meconium testing as a, a universal screening tool will eventually uh, gain pretty widespread acceptance, not just in Canada, but in, in other jurisdictions as well. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Do we? Great. Um, I, can't, I can't see them on my screen, so you'll have yeah. to read them too. Yeah, they only come into to me as the organizer, but uh, they're, they're both from Sheila. And Sheila, I can see that you connected by your computer, so if you do think that you have a microphone and would like to be unmuted, just uh, click the raise hand button. But for now, I'll I'll read the, the questions that you proposed here. Uh, the first question is, if the test is most appropriate for prevalence studies, is it appropriate to include in the screening toolkit? And does this not give the impression it is for targeted use? Uh, well, that's, a, that's an excellent uh, question. I, I think as we worked on the development of the tool, we were um, you know, quite uh, careful to point out that it should not be used for individual uh, targeted use uh, except uh, you know, with very clear informed consent. And as Joey has uh, shown us, uh, getting such informed consent is problematic. Uh, so, um, yes, it's a different kind of tool. Uh, that, that, I think, is acknowledged by all of us, but we really see its main value as being for population screening. If I could, uh, uh, sure, if I could add to, to that, Stuart. Um, Please. Sheila, it's, uh, I, I, uh, I definitely uh, see where you're coming from on that question. Um, it's most sort of ease of application appropriate uses in prevalence studies. Uh, as Stuart said, we don't, we have to be careful when we talk about using universal screening when we're talking about a neonatal screening program such as is already in place in most of the provinces to actually diagnose individual children on a universal scale versus anonymously assessing a, a risk for disease in the population. The uh, inclusion in this, the reason it's included in the screening toolkit is that one of the reasons is that it meets the who the World Health Organization criteria for a screening test, and an individual physician or healthcare provider that is seeking to augment the service they're providing to include FASD on their radar um, has that information at their disposal to be able to use the tool. The physician, um, it's an, just another test on the roster for the physician. Ethically speaking, the physician is bound to um, act in the best interests of the patient. So you require when you're doing a non-routine test like that, that uh, you, know, you, would, you would want to seek informed consent. Um, you also, as a physician, cannot be doing a test on a patient without having a follow-up service. So while universally there aren't programs involved, if you have a pediatrician or a family doctor that's seeing a woman through a pregnancy and thinks the child might be at risk of alcohol exposure and wants to identify that risk because they'll be seeing the child and they can developmentally monitor the child, then it's a legitimate tool for their use. Um, so. I hope that answers somewhat uh, the question you posed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do think we're a long way from uh, ever seeing this uh, put into place as a mandatory uh, test, uh, say along the lines of PDRL or something like that. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly, uh, wholeheartedly with that, Stuart. Yeah. Doug, you said there was a second question from Sheila, or is Sheila on the now now live. And she, she's not live, perhaps she doesn't have a microphone, but uh, she did uh, just uh, put a follow-up and she, she says, so does this mean that, uh, oh, there, she said there's a, there's a photocopier outside of her office door, so perhaps uh, we, there would be a lot of noise in the background. Um, she, she said, for Joey, does this mean that uh, doctors and not CAS workers are requesting the test? Um, so in current model of what often happens is that the CAS workers put in a birth alert to a hospital. 
So this happens whether or not there's meconium testing involved. So when when uh, CAS has a family that's uh, that's under their under their monitoring um, with a woman that's going to deliver, and they believe that child is at uh, safety risk um, because of substance abuse. So the the risk has already been brought to the attention of the CAS. Um, it's not that there's a positive test somewhere and then CAS gets called. So it's very important to understand that this is a population that's already been selected, not for drug use alone, but for safety risk in, uh, in the child care environment. So in those cases, CAS workers will put birth alerts in hospitals and ask for neonatal uh, testing to be done for cocaine or for methamphetamine or whatnot. Now, that's done in hospitals that um, that use meconium analysis or, or don't use meconium analysis. So urine testing is often done on the newborn. Um, the problem with urine testing is it only has a window of detection of a few days. So in jurisdictions where the hospitals work with, um, send samples to our laboratory for meconium analysis, there is a an additional larger window of detection available for assessing that child's prenatal history. <laughs> Now, the physician uh, can order any test deemed necessary in the care of a child that's in his care, so it, the child's his patient. So ordering a meconium test for fatty acid ethyl esters is the same as ordering a urine test for alcohol. It's just more from a, from a physician standpoint. It's just a more uh, effective test because it has a wider window of detection. When we were discussing this in uh, in PEI last uh, September, they, the lawyers who were in our midst were were very uh, concerned about the potential for abuse of this kind of uh, testing. Notwithstanding the fact that it's uh, intended for child protection, uh, they they were uh, adamant that we need to put more framework around this to make sure that the rights of the mother and the family are protected. Uh, as well, and, and recognizing that there may be uh, extreme uh, social and uh, uh, cultural and religious uh, pressures uh, uh, on, a, on a woman who was identified as uh, potentially placing her, her child at risk uh, through, through consumption of ethanol. Um, so, so someone is now saying, is, is there any medical reason to know for the infant? It still sounds like this is a child protection need, not a medical issue. Oh, uh, Joey, you may be better qualified sure. than I am to answer that, uh, um, but I, I would say, of course, it's a mixed... Uh, yes, so uh, I can, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. With alcohol, there is a, a medical need, actually. It's the only drug of abuse that uh, has a medical need for this type of uh, prenatal exposure history, um, long term anyway. The uh, FASD diagnosis cannot be done without a history of prenatal alcohol exposure. So if the child has significant neurodevelopmental delays, but that information was lost or was not obtained to begin with, that child will not get the FASD diagnosis and they will not get access to services that are allotted for FASD. That's extremely important because FASD has a different, um, a different uh, etiology than other neurodevelopmental delays that might be out there. So a child who is FASD that is misdiagnosed as ADHD or as autistic or some, some other misdiagnosis may not be served by the therapies that are accorded to those neurodevelopmental delays um, or, or deficits. So it is uh, actually medically important for that reason is to both identify the child at risk for the disorder to diagnose them early, but even if we get children that are three or four years of age, oftentimes um, the maternal history of, of prenatal alcohol consumption is not available in the child. Uh, never ends up getting the diagnosis and access to services. Uh, Kathy, you may you may have some thoughts on this as as well on the on the medical uh, value of the of the test. Yeah, I do. So, from a clinical point of view, if I have a newborn whose mother 
um, if, if, if the drinking or alcohol exposure history is, has been established by history, at that point I don't ask for a meconium test because I already have the history. Um, the uh, situation here is that if Child and Family Services has enough um, reason to uh, to take the child into care at birth, uh, and, and if they say to me, we're very concerned that there may have been alcohol, but but the history is sketchy, then then we'll absolutely do some screening for alcohol and and other drugs. Uh, but just you know, following up to Joey's comments about how there can be barriers to access to services uh, without a, a clear diagnosis. The other thing that we're we're working really hard here in PEI to do is to um, to uh, change the uh, the framework for children with special needs to de-emphasize the need for a diagnosis and and to provide services based on need and not on diagnosis. Now, having said that, some of the clinical features uh, in the fetal alcohol spectrum can be can be pretty subtle, and the disability can be. Um, uh, uh, difficult to perceive until, uh, especially the adolescent is in difficulty. But I, I have a real problem with diagnosis-based services, just for the reason that you're saying. Because there are, we know there are so many children out there who are alcohol exposed, where we're never going to get a history, and that should not be a barrier to service. Good, uh, Doug. Any other questions? Yeah, there was a question that came in earlier, again, for Joey, and, and they asked, what steps has sick kids taken to ensure that the children are not uh, apprehended due to the result? Um, well, the, uh, the paradigm under which testing is occurring is not, uh, is where the, the, the testing is not eliciting social services involvement. Um, the testing occurs in the context of social services involvement. So this is very different from um, a widespread clinical screening program. We provide clear uh, interpretative guidelines with each and every test result that goes out. Um, but the apprehension of a child is actually a very complex process. Um, and it has to be approved by a judge based on the evidence presented to them by the social worker. I, personally testify on, on a regular basis in family court um, and whenever consulted on it we always emphasize that drug use uh, is not an indicator of a person's behavior. Alcohol use can't tell you how a person behaves uh, and whether or not a child is at risk. Um, it's a piece of the puzzle for them uh, but usually apprehension, um, the drug testing results are not the are not the weighing factor um, as to whether or not a child is actually apprehended at birth, and that happens in in a very small instance of uh, of popul of of the social services population. So I believe the last time I spoke to a worker, actually in the in in um, in one of the regions um, that we work with, their rate of apprehension of children in any of their families is is less than one percent. So they deal with hundreds of hundreds of family. It's really rare that they actually have to take, rare in terms of the total number of families they have, that they actually have to apprehend the children. So I think it's clear that none of us would be advocating the more widespread use of this uh, test if we thought it was uh, intended uh, for uh, for guidance on, on apprehension. That's correct. Uh, it, it, it can't, uh, it can't operate in that in that way. It can only provide one piece of evidence. It cannot be a, a, a decision-making piece of evidence. So we really want to emphasize the importance of the test in population screening, in mm -hmm. giving us a better uh, understanding of the uh, uh, incidence of, of the condition in a particular jurisdiction as a guide to policy and, and as a guide to appropriate medical inter intervention for a child that gets done on basis. Uh, there's a lot, if, if it were going to be used in any other way, uh, there would have to be a, a lot of discussion, I think, by lawyers, ethicists, and, uh, uh, and politicians. There is, a, there is a wealth of information. Um, I mean, in, in terms of addiction treatment, it goes, it, there's, there's a lot of information there. None of it supports 
the fact that there was prenatal substance abuse as being a direct, clear indicator that a child is not safe in, in his mother's care. So anyone working in addictions um, will tell you that, the, that you cannot make that conclusion based on the fact of drug use alone. It's multifactorial, and drugs don't determine a person's behavior. It's a combination of the drug they're taking, their mindset, and the setting in which they're using it. So this is something that anyone in the field will should be able to clearly state, no, we can't assume that, uh, that there's a safety risk based on alcohol or drug use alone. Thanks, Joey. Um, Doug, any more questions? No, we don't have any more questions uh, or hands raised at this point. Well, I believe uh, we're uh, we're right on time, so I'm uh, I'm going to uh, thank our speakers, uh, Joey and Kathy, and uh, uh, Charlotte. I'm turn it over to you for some final remarks. Thank you, Stuart. Well, I, I think you just uh, summed up the discussion uh, very well uh, from the point of view of um, Kathy and, and the public health agency and the work that we hope to continue doing is that uh, for each of the tools we'll be looking at, at further development and validation specifically around meconium testing uh, I think our emphasis is going to be um, uh, studies that that look at anonymous studies that, that look at pre prevalence uh, across the country um, because we're in a bit of a loop uh, People have said here today how important, not only important, but how ethically uh, required it is to, uh, if you identify a child, to have the services that support that child. But we need to have good prevalence data to, uh, to, to make it clear to both policymakers and practitioners and the general public that this is a major problem that resources need to be reallocated to. So we will continue in, in our work, hopefully with the support of the Public Health Agency of Canada, to, uh, to look at larger uh, prevalence studies. And at the same time, I think we would like to keep the discussion going around the more targeted approaches that we talked to today. Uh, obviously, people, just by the questions, people have um, uh, issues and, and concerns about how that's used. I think Kathy and Joey have uh, uh, explained very well the context in, in which meconium uh, screening has been used in, in a targeted uh, situation, but certainly uh, wide-scale uh, automatic uh, screen, non-anonymous screening of uh, uh, women and, and babies is uh, probably not the road that, that will be undertaken. But we would like to, to keep that discussion alive and, and also continue our work around anonymous testing to uh, determine prevalences across Canada. So I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, I'm sure Elaine would like to uh, make some final comments. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. And just in, in closing, um, I want to, uh, first of all, thank you, Stuart, for your, your tremendous facilitation skills this afternoon. I think there was a lot of new um, uh, and important information that has been brought forward. Joey and, and Kathy, <clears throat> thank you for your presentations and, um, <clears throat> and to... Uh, to Doug, um, as always, um, your facilitation and really bringing the expertise on the technical side of our webinar uh, work is, is extremely important, so thank you for that. Just to let everyone know that tomorrow afternoon, <coughs> we don't usually have them back to back, but as it works out, tomorrow afternoon we are very pleased to facilitate our eighth webinar in our series, and this one will be um, specifically on the three screening tools within our kit, uh, and that is the probation officer screening tool, the neurobehavioral um, tool, as well as our maternal drinking guide, and specifically we're going to be receiving what we believe is some very interesting feedback, 
feedback and input specific to the usage of the tools uh, over the last, I'll say, year or so. So we certainly invite everyone online to come and join us for that. And I'm, it, it of course, was the second webinar, um, and the information was part of what you received uh, in joining us today. So on that note, I'm going to close the webinar. I want to thank everyone once again, and we certainly look forward to continuing our work together in this very important area. Thank you one and all.